Uh, you'll find out who Professor J is. Where does it say Professor J? Uh, way down Google here at the it. bottom. Oh. No, don't look up Professor J. You're gonna spoil it. You're gonna spoil my talk if you look up Professor <laughs> J. <laughs> Hey, Bang. so, um, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and start then. Uh, so I'm talking about, uh, metaprogramming and language-oriented design. Uh, so before starting, uh, I know that, uh, a lot of you guys probably don't necessarily know what metaprogramming is. Um, it's a bit of a niche topic, um, that's mostly really talked about in, uh, Lisp languages. Um, it is a little bit in other places as well, uh. C++, um, you can do some metaprogramming with templates. Um, but basically metaprogramming is the ability uh, to treat our code uh, as data that is accessible from our program. Um, so using information about our source code uh, in the program um, and doing something with it basically. Um, so in C Sharp, for example, we can use uh, reflection to get a list of all the properties of an object and that's uh, one form of metaprogramming. Uh, so macros are specifically what I'm going to be talking about um, in this talk, uh, and they're the ability to transform code at compile time. Um, so uh, in Lisp, we can use macros uh, to create all sorts of different uh, transformations um, and even introduce new syntax to our language um, just as easily as like we can define uh, a regular function uh, in Lisp. Um, so one thing that people have kind of talked to me about on the server is like, why the fuck is this important? Um, macros seem like just some, uh, weird theoretical stuff that like, why, why, practically speaking, why would you ever want to transform the abstract syntax tree of, uh, of your program that doesn't really seem practical, uh, a lot of the time. Um, so basically macros are just like objects or higher order functions in functional programming. Uh, they are just another abstraction tool, um, that the language gives us access to. Um, so in Lisp, uh, we favor recursion, um, usually, uh, tail recursion just gets optimized into loops. So we're not really losing, uh, a whole lot of performance, uh, favoring recursion instead. Um, so uh, if we do favor recursion though, then how do we end up doing uh, common constructs like loops, uh, for example? So here we have what is uh, a shitty implementation of, of a loop in, uh, in Racket. Um, so we've defined a variable called x, we've defined a function called looper, and when x is greater than zero, we just print x, decrement it, and then call our uh, looper function recursively. Uh, and then here we also, uh, we just call our looper function to begin looping. Um, so, whoops, that's not what I want to do. Uh, so if I copy all of this over to here uh, and run it, it'll just uh, decrement from 10 down to one and print it out. So that's not what I want to do either. Uh, so this is just like a very uh, naive way of looping. Um, in Racket or in any Lisp, really. Um, and instead, we could implement this as macros. Um, so instead of writing our loop uh, explicitly like that by defining our function and then calling it and uh, calling it recursively every single time, uh, we can define a macro uh, called while. And basically, uh, the rules for the macro are that it takes a condition as the first argument, and then every subsequent argument is a part of the body. Uh, so then we uh, begin, uh, we create a begin block, which basically just executes everything inside that block. Um, we define our looper function exactly as we did before. Uh, we uh, say when the condition is true, um, and then we expand uh, everything that was passed into the body out to here. Uh, and then we call our looper recursively, and then we call our initial looper to get it started. Um, so again, if I copy paste this over to here, um, then we can uh, now use this uh, loop the exact same way that we used the first one before. So it'll print 10 down to one. Um, but now we've completely stripped out all of the boilerplate uh, of uh, the loop that we had before. Um, so we've defined a concise syntax for having a while loop uh, in a language that doesn't have them. Um, 
Now this is a very naive implementation of a while loop because this doesn't implement things like uh, break or continue, which are very important to, uh, to actual while loops. Um, so it's a naive implementation, uh, but it's still uh, something that the language didn't have before. Um, and now we can, using the same syntax as with the rest of our language, we can very simply uh, loop. Um, so uh, to test our macros, um, we can use the uh, expand once function, uh, which if you pass it in a, uh, a quoted list uh, containing the syntax for what we want to um, be inspecting, uh, then it allow us to see what that uh, macro would expand to. So if I do uh, output uh, expand once, and then um, if I do uh, while uh, condition uh, do something, then it will print out uh, exactly what we told it to do. So it uh, has a begin block uh, here. Um, we define a looper function, which is a lambda. Um, uh, inside our function, when the condition is true, then we do something, uh, and then we call our looper function recursively, uh, which is exactly what we expected it to be. Um, that's exactly how we defined it up here. Um, the only difference is that uh, it also took the liberty of expanding this define uh, looper uh, into the full syntax for it, um, which, uh, which is just setting its value to be a lambda function. Uh, so how exactly does this work? Um, so in most programming languages, there is the dichotomy of uh, code and data. Um, and in Lisp, this doesn't exist. Um, so if we look at this uh, little uh, bit of code here, um, it defines two variables, x and y, locally scoped variables, uh, and just performs multiplication of the two of them and then prints the output. Um, so uh, it's, it's very simple. Uh, but if we modify this code by simply adding uh, this one little quote here, uh, that quotation mark, then all of a sudden uh, this code uh, is, is, is no longer code, but it's data. This is now a linked list where the first element is uh, the symbol let, and then it has a nested list um, with two other nested lists. Uh, this one whose head is x, and then its second element is 10, and then finally a last linked list with the symbol uh, asterisk, the symbol x, and the symbol y. Um, and if I go and uh, run this over here, um, it prints it out as, as a list. It doesn't evaluate that code. Um, even though this is syntactically correct code, and this will evaluate uh, to value if we were to simply uh, drop that quote. Um, so we're going to take a quick detour into common lisp to explore exactly how this works. Uh, just because common lisp is a little uh, a little easier to, to look at how uh, it does this because it's got the uh, most naive implementation for macros. Uh, so in common lisp, if I were to define this macro called example, uh, and all it does is it prints its argument and then returns its argument. If I call this with exactly the code that I had before, then this is what it prints out. Uh, it prints out the let, uh, the, the, the code for the let expression uh, with x bound to 10, y bound to 20, and then the multiplication of x and y. Uh, because when we define a macro, the input to our macro is not what the expression evaluates to, but it's rather the code itself. Um, and so inside of our macro, we're able to um, we're able to manipulate our code as lists. Um, so this will output uh, x, which then at runtime uh, will output 200. Um, so this gets printed at compile time, and this gets evaluated at runtime. Uh, somebody unmuted themselves. Do they have a question? They left. They're gone. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, we, we can uh, transform this code uh, entirely using the simple car CDR and cons functions that we use all the time everywhere throughout um, uh, other list programs. Um, so why can't we do this with functions? Um, there's a lot of uh, people that are new to this often are uh, 
uh, confused for kind of like how macros and functions fit together. Um, and so they just really serve different purposes. Um, so if we try to implement our while loop using functions, we could in theory do that. Um, so if we define this, this, uh, this function called while loop with a condition and a body, uh, and notice here uh, that we're not saying uh, every argument beyond the first is the body, but rather the body is a single uh, expression. Uh, then we can say when the condition is true, then we run the body, and then we uh, loop with the condition and body. Um, and it works fine, um, but then when we go and use it, we have to wrap everything up in a lambda, uh, which you don't want to do that. That's not clean. Um, we have our while loop and then our expression is just in, or our condition is just in a lambda and then our whole body is, is in a lambda. Um, it's just not clean. Uh, inside our macro definition or inside our function definition here, uh, we call the body and we call the condition because we expect both of them to be functions. Um, it's just not a, a nice way to implement it really. Um, so we can use our, our macros to make that a lot cleaner. Uh, so another uh, great use case uh, for macros, just for kind of uh, explaining their worth a little bit, uh, is the threading macro. Um, so in a lot of languages, you have access to some form of um, piping operator, um, which is super, super convenient because uh, you don't have to define things as nested functions, for example. Um, you can just uh, take your data and pipe it through uh, a series of function calls. Um, so if we wanted to define that in Lisp, we can do it very easily. Um, so we define, uh, define syntax with, uh, with this piping operator. Um, so I've chosen, uh, this, this arrow notation because this is what Clojure uses. Um, if, uh, if just a single thing is passed into it, then we just return, uh, that one function. Uh, if, uh, a function with a sequence of arguments is passed to it, then we simply, um, uh, put x as the very last thing uh, that gets put into that function call. Um, if, uh, if we have just a single function, then or just a function name, sorry, um, then we call that function with the argument applied to it. Uh, and if we have uh, a, seri a series of different um, functions, uh, then we call our uh, piping macro recursively. Uh, so basically, what this would look like if we didn't have uh, piping would be if I wanted to filter map and uh, reduce this this list here of one, two, three, four, five. Then this is gross and deeply nested, and nobody wants to look at that. Um, so if I use the piping operator instead, uh, then all of a sudden this is very clean. Um, I define my list. I define my uh, filter, um, which only contains the first argument. I have my map, which also only contains the first argument, and I have my fold, which contains the first two arguments. Um, and basically the output of this filter function is going to be uh, inserted into the last argument of my filter, and then this whole filter is going to be inserted into the last argument of this map, and then the map is going to be inserted into the last argument of the fold. Um, so uh, we could also define um, the uh, the other variant of the threading macro, which is just um, like that, uh, which would insert as the first argument instead of the last. Um, but just for sake of this example, um, I defined uh, the uh, threading after. Um, it would just be a matter of changing up two lines uh, in this function or in this macro so that uh, our x was here instead of at the end, uh, and then one more basic change to the last clause. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very simple macro uh, that allows us to clean up our code a lot, um, as you can see down here. Um, so a lot of what we can do in Lisp um, actually boils down to uh, macros and lambda functions. Um, those are like some of the two most important things uh, in Lisp. Um, because the entire language really can be made out of them. Um, so if we look at our uh, let expression, for example, um, we have the exact same let that we had earlier. Um, we bind uh, 10 to x, we bind 20 to y, and then we uh, calculate the product of the two. Um, but this would be functionally identical to saying lambda that takes two parameters, x and y, um, calculates the product of the two, 
and then is immediately called with the values uh, 10 and 20. Um, but we use let because it's a lot cleaner, obviously. Um, but uh, let is defined as a macro. Um, so uh, we can define let like this. Um, the first argument to it uh, is a list that contains two values, an ID and a parameter, or an ID and a value. Uh, and it contain, can, can contain any number of those. Uh, and then after that, it just has uh, a sequence of expressions um, that is the body. Um, so then uh, we take our lambda. Um, so, so, so the output of this macro is going to contain a lambda um, with the IDs expanded, um, the body expanded, and then the values expanded uh, that are used to call uh, the lambda. Um, so this would expand into, uh, into exactly the code that we have up here, um, which is evaluated as uh, 10 times 20. Um, we could also define our, our let star, uh, which if you uh, recall back to uh, 348 allows you to um, uh, define your, uh, your, your variables based off of the value of previous bindings in the same block. Um, here we obviously can't do that because x and y are defined at the same level uh, in the same scope. Um, we don't have access to the value of x um, when we're defining our y here. Um, but if we were to uh, have this defined as let star, then this would actually just be a series of nested lambdas that are all called um, uh, immediately with their uh, proper arguments. Uh, another useful uh, form of lambda or of, of uh, let is the named let, um, which allows us to call let blocks recursively. Um, and it's super, super helpful. Um, so this is a slightly more uh, complicated macro. Um, because for this one, we need to uh, have a previous definition of the uh, rec macro. And the rec macro allows us to define uh, recursive bindings. Um, so if we call the rec macro with uh, a name and then some arguments, uh, followed by a series of expressions for the body, um, then we'll call the rec macro recursively with the name um, and then those arguments as the arguments to a new lambda, and then the body expanded out. Uh, so then in the uh, base case for it, basically, um, we'll define uh, a function um, with the given name and the value. So that value is going to be a lambda function, uh, and then we just return, return the name. Uh, so then in our uh, nlet uh, macro, that's named let, um, the, the way that it varies from our normal let is that we're going to allow it to have this, uh, this tag here. Um, so then it creates uh, a recursive function definition um, using the uh, rec macro that uses the tag as a name, uh, the ID as um, the, the, um, the arguments, uh, sorry, to, to the function. Uh, and then the body uh, to the let, the named let, uh, and then the values that we want to be binding um, binding to. Um, so now we can use our named let like this. Um, so we've defined uh, a named let block called sum uh, that has a list from 0 to 10. Um, uh, if the list is empty, then we return zero. Otherwise, we take the sum of the uh, head of the list and recursively call our uh, let block with the tail of the list. Um, so if I copy uh, all of this um, and paste it over here, um, and also copy um, this let block, uh, if I run that, empty is undefined. Oh, uh, sorry, I need to require the, raw, the module for it. Um, uh, racket slash list, I believe. That should make this work. Cool, there we go, 55. Um, sorry about that. Uh, 
Um, so we've defined this, this uh, recursive let block that allows us to um, uh, define a very concise piece of functionality uh, and then call it recursively without actually uh, going through the whole boilerplate of defining a function uh, and then calling it. Um, so if you know JavaScript, this is uh, a kind of similar pattern to a named uh, immediately invoked function expression um, that you then call recursively, um, but with much more concise syntax than that. Uh, so in addition to these kind of obvious places that we could have macros um, for control flow operators, um, for uh, various constructs in our language, they also come in a lot of unexpected places. Um, so if we have uh, an or function, um, this is the definition for our or. Um, define match is, is a macro that will uh, define a function that simply pattern matches over its arguments. Um, so if, uh, if args is an empty list, then it'll return true. If it's a, a list of one element, then it'll return the, uh, the value of that one element. So if it's true, it'll return that. If it's false, it'll return that. Um, and otherwise, uh, it will uh, expand the list into a head and a tail. Uh, if the head is true, it'll return the head. Otherwise, um, it will call itself recursively um, using the tail. Um, so if I define this, and I believe I actually am going to have to rename this to my or uh, because it will complain since or is already defined. Bad syntax. Um, let me go back to just having this as or. Maybe it will work. No, bad syntax. Oh, yeah, okay, now this is going to complain. So what's the bad syntax earlier? I thought I tested this. I thought this had worked. Well, crap. Okay. Um, I'm just going to move on. Take my word for it that this works, I guess. I don't know. Um, but if I were to call it, um, then uh, uh, with this, for example, then it would return 10 um, because or in Lisp doesn't actually... Uh, return a boolean. Um, instead, it returns the first non-false element, um, uh, which is great. Um, but what if we were to do something like this, where we say uh, or true and then some long function that we need to compute? Um, we're going to run into an issue here because we know that this is true. This is always going to be true. Whoops. Uh, this is... Shit, I just went back up a bunch of slides. Or forward a bunch of slides. Um, this is always going to be true. This is a tautology here. Um, why do we need to compute uh, some long function um, that's just going to uh, slow us down needlessly? Uh, so instead, um, we can define uh, or as a, um, as a macro. Um, so if we've defined this, this or here, um, then it'll be basically the exact same thing as our function version. Uh, if there's no arguments passed to it, it'll just return true. If there's a single argument passed to it, uh, it'll return that argument. Uh, and if there's multiple arguments, um, then we're going to say if the first one is true, then return that. Um, but otherwise, uh, call itself recursively with the rest of the arguments. Um, which looks like the exact same thing, but because of the fact that the arguments uh, are only going to be uh, evaluated when they need to be, in this case, instead of uh, evaluate when they're passed into the or function at runtime, uh, this will allow us to only, uh, we, we only reach uh, the nested if that computes that long function if the previous ones uh, didn't return true. Um, so it's a, it's a convenient way of uh, shortcutting any uh, long function call uh, that could slow down our program and just say, as soon as one thing is true, we just say that this or branch is true. Um, so macros can clearly be used for a lot of different things. Uh, looping constructs, logical operators, recursive blocks. Uh, we did the threading macros with them. Uh, you can define a, a, a crap ton with them. We can even define lambda in terms of lambda with macros. Um, because the Lambda functions that we have access to in Lisp are uh, much more complicated than just straight up 
plain Lambda functions. They allow things like uh, um, rest parameters. They allow optional default values. Uh, they allow optional parameters. They allow keyword parameters. Um, all of that is a lot more complicated uh, than just a plain ass Lambda function. But we could define the Lambda functions that we have right now in terms of a uh, plain Lambda function that simply takes one argument and that's it. Um, and we can define uh, everything that we have right now in terms of macros and Lambda functions. But that would be a lot more code than I'm willing to show you right now. Um, so this is a language called uh, Ripost. Um, it is a language built on top of Racket uh, designed to be a scripting language for testing REST APIs. Uh, and as you can see, this looks absolutely nothing uh, like the code that we had before. Um, so what I was ignoring in all the other um, examples that you need to have at the top of every single Racket file is this hashtag lang line. Uh, and most of the time in a regular Racket file, that is going to be hashtag lang racket. Um, and what this line does is it actually tells the compiler uh, which reader to be using to parse the current file. Um, and so uh, if you provide a different hashtag lang here, then Racket will uh, basically dispatch its parsing to an entirely different program uh, that is user-defined. Um, so hashtag lang ripost uses the ripost parser. Um, and the ripost parser is going to output completely valid Racket code. Um, it needs to expand into valid racket. Um, so this could, I, I don't actually know what it would output, uh, but this could be defined as something like uh, uh, define schema, um, and then uh, let's say that that's a, uh, a struct um, with like a, a, a JSON struct or something. Um, I don't know, with uh, it maybe it creates a data type behind the scenes. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but it defines, it, it, it just expands out into racket code. Um, and so this is something called reader macros. Um, it's when you define a, a, a special way for the language uh, to read in symbols that aren't normally um, recognized by, uh, by the reader. Um, and this is something that's pretty unique to Lisp. Um, because of the fact that the Lisp syntax is very, very, very simple um, and defines the uh, exact layout for the abstract syntax tree of your programming language, uh, you're able to create these special types of macros um, that, uh, that are able to completely change the syntax of the language. So Professor J um, is uh, another uh, language implemented using reader macros uh, that defines uh, a, a fairly large subset of Java um, using entirely macros in Lisp. So this would actually get expanded out to plain racket code. Um, we have our, uh, our, our void main function that takes an argument of strings um, and uh, sets the value of the string variable result to high. Uh, and this is just pulled straight from the docs uh, for Racket. This is actually something that ships with the Racket language um, because uh, it's, it's a teaching module for the language. Um, so so I'm, I'm just going to back up here. I want, I want to point out the fact that um, this is statically typed. Um, we've defined this as a string and we've defined this as an array of strings. This is statically typed here, even though Racket is a dynamically typed language. Um, so since the reader macros uh, are one of the first things that are done in the compilation process and all they need to do is output valid Racket code, it means you can do full type checking uh, at compile time in Racket um, using macros. Uh, so typed Racket um, is a gradually typed uh, hashtag lang that ships with Racket that allows full static compile time type checking. Um, so this means that even though the static typing is implemented in a library, it's still uh, full proper compile time static type checks. Um, and it can even go to the point where there's actually a implementation of Haskell uh, in Racket called uh, Hackett, 
um, that uh, demonstrates the flexibility of Racket's macros uh, to implement what is a very sophisticated type system. Um, it's really cool, actually. Uh, so um, I just added this today. In hindsight, I probably should have put it somewhere else in here. Um, but, uh, but one thing that we're also able to do with, uh, with macros, uh, like I mentioned, um, earlier about the, uh, while loop is, uh, we want to break and a continue, um, because those are things that are very helpful to have, um, in a while loop. And so here, uh, we've defined, uh, this syntax parameter called break. Um, and basically what it allows you to do is, uh, say, um, when this construct is used from outside of, uh, from, from, from the top level, from outside of, uh, the, um, macro that it's used within, uh, just throw an error because it's only allowed to be used within the context of a while body. Uh, and then here we have our, uh, macro for a new while loop. Um, so this one defines the, uh, the, the break, um, and then it does the same thing as we did before, uh, except this is using a named let now instead of a function. Um, so when the condition is true, um, it will uh, run the body, um, except with the um, condition here that uh, when break is called, it's going to uh, basically jump back up to this, this uh, fresh break tag here. Um, uh, and then it's just going to loop exactly as we did before. Um, so this is a way that you can implement um, a proper break and continue system uh, in Racket. The, uh, the only difference um, is, uh, is that here I didn't implement uh, the continue. Uh, if I wanted to implement continue, all I'd have to do is drop another let uh, like uh, right up here um, between these two lines there. Uh, or maybe between these two lines one or the other, it'll work. Um, but yeah, we can, we can implement uh, break and continue uh, by defining these rules uh, that are only allowed to be used uh, within macros. Um, so where is the practicality in all of this? Um, between defined syntax and reader macros, you clearly have a lot of flexibility. Um, but what what, what, what do you do with this? Where do, where, where do you go with this kind of stuff? Um, so macros are just another abstraction tool. Um, they're just like functions and objects, um, except they're not first class. You can't pass them around and stuff as variables, but otherwise the same thing. Um, but sometimes there's ideas that you just can't clearly express um, in the language that you're given. Um, so SQL, for example, is a incredibly declarative uh, language. Um, it has a very clean way of representing queries across data. Uh, across data. Um, so we can, of course, represent SQL queries by chaining function calls together, uh, or in a more functional manner, we can uh, uh, take functions that accept other functions as variables and then return functions and then build up complicated queries like that. Um, but it's just not going to be as nice as SQL is. Um, and some languages recognize this, like C-sharp, for example. Um, it provides you with the uh, link syntax uh, to write um, SQL queries using SQL-like syntax in C-sharp. Um, in Racket, we can uh, define our own syntax like that using macros. Uh, so we're not, going to f we're not going to define our own macros uh, in this talk. I was actually originally planning on it. Um, but then figured it's probably not necessarily the, the best showcase uh, of what Racket's able to do. Um, maybe I should have done it. I don't know. It probably already exists. Um, but what we could do is uh, using um, defined syntax, make something that looks exactly like this. So this is just plain SQL syntax. The only difference is that our keywords select from and where uh, are using this uh, this um, uh, hashtag colon uh, syntax, which basically means in, in Racket that these uh, these values are interpreted literally, and so uh, it's it's what's called a self-evaluating uh, form. Uh, I'm not going to really go into it. It's just a symbol that uh, 
will always mean uh, that same thing. Anyways, um, so we could define uh, SQL syntax exactly like this, and uh, this um, the SQL macro uh, would just output um, valid uh, valid SQL as a string or something, so that then you could um, I don't know, like pass that off to uh, pass that off to a function that um, like makes a call to your to your database. Um, but you could formulate your actual SQL queries like this, uh, and then because your queries are just uh, random bits of data, you can of course uh, like compose SQL queries by like kind of creating like templated queries uh, and then like injecting uh, variables into that in different places and do all sorts of things with it. Um, but yeah, it's just SQL syntax in Lisp. Um, so yeah, metaprogramming and macros allow some really cool things. Um, it facilitates the creation of new abstractions that we don't really have access to uh, in other languages. Um, and macros are getting a little bit more popular with languages like Rust and Nim implementing them. Uh, and there's even actually a proposal for uh, Python to implement syntactic macros. Um, but because of the lack of dichotomy, uh, the lack of the dichotomy, can't walk, can't talk right now. Uh, dichotomy between code and data in Lisp. Um, it allows macros to be used very, uh, very extensively uh, throughout uh, Lisp, and they're they're literally everywhere uh, in Lisp programs. Um, and build up, uh, build up very, very complicated languages using some very simple core components, which are lambda and macros. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Nice. I had to. I have to say, I was going to ask a really good question at the end, but you answered it for me. Hey. I was going to say, how would you, how would you, how would you, how would you do the break uh, in Lisp oh, or in yeah. macros? I, I actually wasn't so planning. Nice. I actually wasn't planning on doing it. Um, I just added that today, like I said. Um, so, uh, I, I I didn't extensively test it, um, but it does work. Nice. Good going. Um, I really like the template too. I love the, on the right hand side, you have your execution of code and on the left hand side, you have your, your nice notes. It's really clean. It does Thank a you. really good talk. Yeah. yeah I, I, I'd, I'd uh, tested the whole thing out and I'm not sure what the issue with why this isn't working. Um, what's, what's the period for? Uh, it basically says every argument uh, beyond the required arguments uh, gets put into args as a list. Um, so since there's no required arguments, um, uh, every argument to the uh, my or function is uh, is a list. I see. I um, see. So I uh, do. Whoops. Uh, do have the actual code for that uh, in this? No, I apparently only have the macros for it. Okay. So I don't have the code that does work. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why that's throwing a syntax error there. Um, we can take your word for it. Yeah, it should work. It just doesn't for some reason. <laughs> nice. I'm sure it's just a stupid mistake that I made. Um, so yeah. Dangerous uh, of live coding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, can you, like, my, my list is super rusty. Can you go over <laughs> the. Um, the break again? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. So um, this isn't something that you'll see in Comp 348 or anything. Whoa, why did that give me weird coloring? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, what this does um, is uh, we define um, our our while here, um, and so we define the uh, format for what uh, we want our while to look like. Um, so it accepts a condition um, and then uh, a, a series of um, expressions that's going to make up the body uh, of our of our while. Okay. Um, so here we've defined um, it's basically a point that we're able to uh, jump back out to. Uh, it's basically like a jump point or something. Um, oh. So. Uh, 
so inside uh, our, our, uh, our line here, um, when the break is called, and this uh, force used with parents uh, is actually something um, that it's, it's a long macro, so I didn't put it into this file. Um, uh, but this is the macro here. Um, whoops, I also, um, this is the macro for force used with parents. Uh, I also didn't include the macro, uh, the conditions for when uh, you call uh, the while loop with uh, incorrect syntax, uh, just because that adds four lines that I didn't really have to spare. Um, and in here, I also implement the uh, continue. Um, so I have another tag up here, the, uh, the, the fresh continue tag here. Um, so if continue is called, then it would, uh, it would jump back up to this point. Um, uh, which at that point, uh, it's finished executing the body, so it'll break out and then just uh, recall uh, the loop. Uh, so this, okay. is, this is the full macro for, for the while, um, including the helper macro up here. And uh, let EC, that's some like racket, something racket provides? Yeah. Yeah, so I believe let EC comes from the uh, racket uh, STX param library. Um, I'm actually not sure if it's part of Racket Base or part of that library, um, but yeah, it's just something that Racket provides. All right, sweet, thanks. No problem. Anybody else? No? All right, well, I will go ahead and stop recording this then. Oh, you recorded.